was in charge of this had sabotaged the guidance system so that it wouldn't go where it was supposed to go. And the American engineers who were responsible for some of these experiments were complaining like mad to the Pentagon, saying that these guys are nuts. You know, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They are not really on our side. Well, we're going to now move into another area. But just for a second, we think about this situation, this scenario. We had German scientists working for us, stationed at military bases in the United States, who were totally unmonitored. They could leave the base at any time. They would go walking through town. They opened up mailboxes. They were receiving mail from Europe. They were sending mail out to Europe. A lot of it went to Eastern Europe because they had colleagues who had been taken by the Soviets. In order to help their German, in order to help their German scientists, Nazi scientist colleagues, in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc, they were sending American blueprints over to Eastern Germany, to East Germany and to, to Russia. At the same time, they're working in the United States. These records have since been declassified, not all of them. I mean, God forbid we should declassify records that are 60 years old from World War II, right? You know, you're, you're wondering right now, is there a secret space program? Well, there was a secret space program in the 1940s, for sure. There was a secret space program in the 1950s. We didn't know what was going on. As an American growing up, with the threat constantly of the atomic bomb, and you know, the Russians were going to bomb us and they were, we were all going to die, and I had to hide my head under a desk because that would save me. Growing up with this, we thought that Werner von Braun was a good German. He was not a Nazi, he was on our side. Later, only later, only in the last few years, have we been able to find out that these guys had never been really on our side. They were true believers in their cause. The Nazi party was not just a political party. You know, it was not Republicans and Democrats, or like we have in the States. It was not people concerned about if we're going to have an ordinance for running a, a cable line or water or sewer. They cared nothing about that. The Nazi party was a cult of true believers. Just because they lost the war doesn't mean they lost their true faith. So they maintained it through thick, thick and thin. They looked down on their captors in the United States. To them, it was a toss-up. Do we go to Russia? Do we go to the United States? There was no ideological choice being made. It was strictly a pragmatic one. Where are we going to get the best deal? You know? They were operating on their own. They were operating with their own agenda. So in 1947, we have the Cold War. First, we bomb Mexico. And we apologize for that later. Then we have the Kenneth Arnold sighting. We have the Maury Island affair. We have, famously, Roswell. In 1947, that same year, the CIA is created. The Department of the Air Force is created. A year later, Truman defeats Dewey. I mention this because of the, the relationship to the other in incidents that we're talking about. In 1950, the Korea War begins. Okay, so now we're in, we're in Cold War mode. Russians have poured across the border into North Korea. Okay, the brainwashing thing starts. Everybody's freaking out about the, the weird science that the Russians are using to brainwash American soldiers. Okay, a person very involved in this, in all the hysteria around this, in 1952, holds a seance in a farmhouse in Maine. The man is, no, not the Pope, not the funny hat guy, the other guy, Andrea Puharich. Andrea Puharich was a medical doctor, he was an inventor, he was a military man, a captain in the army, stationed at, Fort, at Camp Dietrich, later Fort Dietrich, Edgewood, Ar Edgewood Arsenal later, he was stationed at. This is the area of the United States, a military that's involved with chemical and biological weapons. Puharich, however, was involved in trying to weaponize paranormal abilities. Puharich's focus in 1952, as early as 1952, is how can we use ESP, telepathy, all these things, in a military capacity. Since now we're facing a Cold War with people who use brainwashing methods, Puharich suddenly becomes a hot ticket item. He's talking about using the human brain and the powers of the brain to do all sorts of horrible things to people. He brings together nine people in a seance. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you realize who these people are. One of them is Arthur Young. Some of you may have heard of Arthur Young. He wrote a lot of very well-received books, The Reflexive Universe, The Geometry of Meaning. Arthur Young was a, was a great guy. He was the inventor of the Bell helicopter. He sold his rights in all of that. He left military uh, engineering, military development at the end of World War II in order to pursue full-time his interest in the paranormal. 
He studied yoga, Eastern religions, ESP, psychokinesis, astrology, you name it, he was into it, Arthur Young. His wife, Ruth Forbes Payne Young, she was also at the seance. So we have Arthur Young, the inventor of the Bell helicopter, the guy who created the Bell helicopter, along with Larry Bell, his partner. We have his wife, the excessively nomenclatured Ruth Forbes Payne Young. That's all her husband. So she's married first to a Forbes. John Kerry, our presidential candidate, was a Forbes. This is a very old, very famous family. She was married to George Lyman Payne. Payne was a direct descendant of one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and related, uh, coincidentally, to an actor called Robert uh, Treat Payne. Long story. But anyway, Ruth Forbes, also married to a Payne, also married to Arthur Young. Not at the same time, you know, one after the other. She has a son, Michael Payne, who then gets a job at Bell Aerospace through Arthur Young's influence, because Arthur Young helped create the company. Her son needs a job. He gets him a job at Bell Aerospace in Texas. Her best friend is Mary Bancroft. Mary Bancroft was the longtime mistress of Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, as you know, was a famous head of the CIA, the one that Jack Kennedy fired over the Bay of Pigs when he told Dulles he was going to split the CIA into a million pieces. Alan Dulles was the one who was fired by Kennedy and who later wound up on the Warren Commission investigating Kennedy's death, very conveniently. So these are two people, two of the nine. So Michael Payne's boss, right, the boss of Michael Payne, Arthur Young's son-in-law, is none other than General Walter Dornberger. And he's shown here. That's Dornberger over here, and that's Himmler over here. And they all got hats. So these are all guys. So Michael Payne has his, these direct connections right back to Paperclip, back to the space program. Michael Payne's wife is also named Ruth. She's Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne is a Quaker. She likes folk dancing, walks on the beach, uh, candlelit dinners, and the Russian language. Allegedly, she's studying Russian. That's Ruth Payne. That's Michael and Ruth in Irving, Texas. That's Ruth Payne again. She's sitting way over on the left. Here is a woman called Marguerite, Marguerite Oswald. Here is Marina Oswald. The picture was taken on November 22, 1963, the day that Kennedy was assassinated that evening. They're photographed in Ruth Payne's living room in Irving, Texas. It was Ruth Payne who got Lee Harvey Oswald the job at the Texas School Book Depository, right on the route where he would be able to assassinate the president. That's Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne had visited Arthur Young and her mother-in-law, Ruth Forbes Payne Young, in Philadelphia in September of 1963. She had Marina Oswald, this Russian defector, the wife of Lee Harvey Oswald, and her children living with her in her house. What was she talking about to Arthur Young, I wonder? Did she ever mention the fact that, hey, I got this Russian defector and his wife living with me in Irving, Texas? Lee Oswald, maybe you heard of him. He was a Marine. He defected to the Soviet Union, wanting to become a Russian citizen. He redefected back to the United States. He did all of this, and the guy's still only 24 years old. That's pretty good for a 24-year-old. A Marine, somebody involved in the Atsugi Air Base and radar technicians, a guy who spoke Russian fluently enough that his Russian-born wife thought he was Russian. Now, I don't know about you. I studied a lot of languages in my time. I mean, Mandarin, Spanish, French, Italian. I've done a lot of languages. I've studied Russian. Russian is a damn hard language to learn. And yet this young kid, with no, hardly any formal education, just barely got out of high school, joins the Marines and learns to speak fluent Russian like that, so much that he can convince Marina that he's fluent, that he's, he's a native Russian. So Marina, Marina Oswald, the niece of a KGB, uh, excuse me, an NKVD, an Army Military Intelligence uh, officer, marries Lee Harvey Oswald, this Marine defector, a very famous defector, and they decide to go back to the United States. Ruth Payne wants to learn Russian. That's her story. Oh, I'd love to learn Russian from Marina Oswald. So she gives her some room in her house because they're broke. And then Lee goes to Texas, and well, the rest is history. 
So here's the nine. Here's the, the connection of these nine people. I didn't mention all the people of the nine. We'll get to that, but they're mostly DuPonts, Astors, Forbes, etc. These are the wealthiest families in the United States at the time, blue blood Americans with long pedigrees going back to the Mayflower or to the Declaration of Independence in some cases. Representatives of these families were at this bizarre seance. And during this seance in Maine, they were contacted according to all the published documentation. I'm not making this stuff up and I'm not speculating. Puharich himself published this documentation saying that aliens, a group of nine, contacted the group of nine who were at this seance and said, we are nine, you are nine, we're giving you the mission you know, to help transform life on the planet. And what was their first major contribution was you know, having to do with the assassination of President Kennedy. So this nine to me is very strange. We have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. Did that somehow promote you know, evolution on this planet or did that do just the opposite? So there's Arthur Young. There's his daughter-in-law, Ruth Payne, Lee Harvey Oswald to Kennedy. The connections are very tight. And another member of the nine, of course, was an Astor, as I mentioned, Ava Alice Muriel Master, Astor. So all American aristocracy. September 12, 1962, Kennedy makes his famous, we shall go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard the last time an American president talked to Americans this way. We're going to do things not because they're easy, because they're hard, because that's what we're going to do. He told Congress of the moon mission May 25, 1961. In September 62, over a year later, he reiterates this in a very famous speech. You can catch it on YouTube. It's everywhere. Very brilliant, very passionate speech about what we're going to do. And then, of course, in November of the following year, he's assassinated. What does all this have to do with what we're talking about? Okay, in New Orleans, before the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald gets a job with the William Riley Coffee Company. The coffee company still exists. He went down there to get a job. He worked for a short time. He quits. He tells a co-worker, hey, I've just found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, according to the quotation. He's getting a job at NASA. Well, in 1957, we sent up we didn't send up, the Russians sent up a Sputnik, and that scared the hell out of the American military establishment. It scared the hell out of the American people. They said, we have all these Nazi scientists, you know, what are we getting for our, you know, what bang for the buck are we getting here? So we have to do something about this. And so they put the fear of God into the Nazi scientists and said, okay, listen guys, you know, enough is enough, we fooled around enough, now we have to actually do something. And so the government took control of the space program away from the military and gave it to a civilian organization, NASA. The problem with that was they moved the Nazi scientists from the military to NASA. So it was a change in name only. You know, suddenly you have military scientists who were Nazis, who were true believers. Now they're working for a civilian agency for NASA under the U.S. government. We didn't really change anything. Direct military control was lost, but the Nazis were still in command. After the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald leaves the William Riley Coffee Company. He never does work for NASA although we find out that he was probably working out of an office at the NASA site that was a, an employment agency for the CIA. This is something that's also come up recently. Anyway, he leaves William Riley. He leaves New Orleans, goes to Texas. After the assassination, his co-workers also all get jobs at NASA. At NASA. They're coffee company clerks, and they got jobs at NASA. As I mentioned, Ruth Payne had visited his wife, uh, visits Arthur Young and his wife. Or he's been told that he's been in contact with these nine supernatural beings. Andrea Puharich, the guy who organizes this, the captain in the army involved in weaponizing the paranormal. He's the guy who discovers Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic who bends spoons by looking at them. He brings Uri Geller to the United States. He gets him involved at the Sanford Research Institute run by Scientologists, as it turns out. All this other stuff is going on. Uri Geller eventually says he got tired of it. He thought that he was being run by Puharich as an intelligence asset. He really felt that Puharich was an intelligence agent running him uh, as an agent for one of the intelligence agencies. But part of that program was that he felt from time to time he was being put in contact with extraterrestrial beings. 
you know, Geller was mystified.